Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today for an important update on OSHA's COVID-19 vaccination and testing ETS. For those of you joining us on a webinar for the first time, MP is a full service human capital management company offering a complete suite of products and services to support employers through the entire employee life cycle, including recruiting, HR, payroll, benefits administration, time and attendance, and compliance assistance. We support our clients with cutting edge technical solutions, as well as proactive, reliable service and deep HR and payroll expertise. At MP, we are wired for HR and help our clients succeed by aligning their people strategy with their business goals. I am thrilled to introduce your presenters for today, two of MP's top HR experts, Sherry Heller and Jen Saray. Sherry is a Sherm's Sherm and PHR certified HR partner here at MP. She has over 20 years of experience in employee relations, training and development, strategic planning, and policy development. Sherry earned a Master of Education in Instructional Design from UMass, and she spent many years in retail management prior to getting into HR, which provides her with a unique business focus to human resources. Jen is a Sherm certified HR partner here at MP. MP, and she received her BA from Clark University and previously managed HR for the Northeast Division of a national nonprofit organization. Jen loves building relationships with her clients while helping them meet their HR goals. Just a few housekeeping um, items before we open the program today. Please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen to submit your questions. We'll be addressing questions at the end of the program. Um, and later today, we'll be sending out a recording of the webinar along with the slide and other resources. And with that, I'm going to hand the mic off to Jen. Thank you so much, Amy. And before we get started today, uh, thank you all for, for joining us on Veterans Day. Some of you may be have the day off or you are working. We, we appreciate you joining us uh, this afternoon. But before we begin, we do want to share our legal disclaimer and let you know that today's training is intended for educational and informational purposes. You know, we're coming out this from the HR perspective. Um, we hope that you learn a lot today, but we're not attorneys. So the information that we share today should not be construed as legal advice. Okay, so let's look at the topics we'll be going over today. Um, we'll first go over who is considered a covered employer for the ETS, the requirements of the ETS, mandatory vaccination policies, how to go about determining the uh, vaccination status of your employees, weekly COVID testing, and then we'll share some helpful resources. And we'll uh, also do our best to save some time um, at the end of the presentation to answer all of your questions. So first, um, things first, on uh, November 4th, OSHA released its highly anticipated COVID-19 vaccination emergency temporary standard, establishing a new mandatory vaccination uh, requirements for private employers with 100 or more employees. Then two days later, the US Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals issued a stay freezing the ETS. The rule is also facing other separate legal challenges. So where are we now with this mandate? While the federal appeals court is considering arguments for and against a permanent injunction, larger employers should still become familiarized with the requirements of the ETS and plan to uh, uh, a plan in, put a plan in place to implement these requirements in the event the stay is lifted. And this is important because if and when the stay is lifted, we aren't sure if the time frame or the deadlines will change or if they'll stay the same. And there are significant penalties for non-compliance, so it's going to be essential that you're prepared to follow the ETS. And private employers with 100 or more employees company-wide, not by individual work location, are considered covered employers. Employers with a fluctuating headcount will need to start by determining the number of employees they had as of the November 5th uh, effective date of the standard. If you had 100 or more employees as of November 5th, the ETS applies for the duration of the standard, even if your headcount drops below 100. 
if you had less than 100 employees on November 5th, but then uh, you go and hire more, more workers and hit that 100 employee threshold for coverage, you would then be expected to come into compliance with the standards requirements. So essentially, once an employer has come um, within the scope of the ETS, the standard continues to apply for the remainder of the time it's in effect, regardless of fluctuations in the size of the employer's workforce. So now let's talk about which workplaces are not covered by the ETS. Workplaces covered under the Safer Federal Workforce Task Force, COVID-19 Workplace Safety Guidance for Federal Contractors and Subcontractors that was published by OSHA on September 24th, as well as um, settings where any employee provides healthcare services or healthcare support services when subject to the requirements of the healthcare ETS published by OSHA on June 21st. Workplaces of employers who have fewer than 100 employees total and public employers in states without state plans. So how are employees counted? All employees, including part-time employees and those working from home count towards the threshold as well as seasonal or temporary workers who are employed directly by the business. On a multi-employer work site, like a construction site, each company uh, represented, uh, including the host employer, the general contractor, and each subcontractor would only need to count its own employees. And independent contractors and seasonal or temporary workers who are employed through a staffing agency do not count uh, towards the thresholds. Now, when does this take effect if it all goes down um, as we are currently understanding it? Uh, we're not sure if the stay issued by the Federal Court of Appeals will impact these dates, but as per this ETS, the deadline for employers to enforce the mask mandate and other provisions of the ETS is December 5th, and workers must be vaccinated or start getting tested by January 4th. OSHA anticipates that the ETS will be in effect for six months, but there is a possibility that it could be extended or made more permanent. All right, um, state OSHA plans. So currently 22 states have OSHA approved state plans regulating private sector employers. And generally those state plans must be at least as effective as the standards set by OSHA. The federal OSHA ETS will not apply immediately in those states. They have 30 days to adopt the federal standard or inform OSHA of their plans to do something else. Okay, now let's talk about vaccine exceptions. If an employer is covered by the ETS, it doesn't mean that all of its employees have to follow the provisions of the ETS. The requirements of the ETS don't apply to employees who do not report to a workplace where other individuals are present, employees working from home, employees who work exclusively outdoors. Um, so a little more information on how you define outdoors, because there are some um, pretty strict guidelines uh, there. In order to qualify as work performed exclusively outdoors, um, the employee must work outdoors on all days. For example, an employee who works indoors on some days and outdoors on other days would not be exempt. The employee must not routinely occupy vehicles with other employees as part of work duties. So, um, you know, they couldn't drive to work sites together in a company vehicle. And the, uh, the employee works outdoors for the duration of every workday, except for the de minimis use of indoor spaces where other individuals may be present. So that means, you know, a multi-stall bathroom or an administrative office, as long as the time spent indoors is brief. And the employee's work must truly occur outdoors, which does not include buildings under construction, where are substantial portions of the structure are in place, such as walls and ceiling elements that would impede the natural flow of fresh air at the work site. Okay, and exceptions from um, a mandatory vaccination policy would include accommodations made for those with medical contraindications, medical necessity requiring delay in vaccination, or reasonable accommodations for workers with disabilities or sincerely held religious beliefs. And under the ADA, employers must evaluate requests to determine whether a reasonable accommodation would enable the employee to perform all essential functions of their job without posing a direct threat to the safety of themselves or others, which cannot be eliminated or reduced through reasonable accommodation. For religious accommodations, 
you should confirm whether the employee's accommodation request is based upon a sincerely held religion, religious belief or practice, how receiving the vaccine would violate the employee's beliefs, and what accommodation the employee is requesting. Employees who fall under these exceptions would still need to follow the procedures applicable to employees who are not fully vaccinated, including COVID-19 testing and the use of face coverings. Okay, the, now let's talk about the written vaccination policy. The ETS requires employers to develop, implement, and enforce a mandatory COVID-19 vaccination policy with an exception for employees, um, for, for employers that instead establish, implement, and enforce a policy allowing employees who are not fully vaccinated to elect to undergo weekly COVID-19 testing and wear face covering at the workplace. The written vaccination policy should address all of the applicable requirements of the standard, including requirements for COVID-19 vaccination, any applicable exclusions from the written policy that we already uh, covered, the medical contraindications, medical necessity requiring delays in vaccination, or the reasonable accommodations for workers with disabilities or sincerely held religious beliefs, information on determining an employee's vaccination status and how this information will be collected, paid time and sick leave for vaccination purposes, notification of positive COVID-19 tests and removal of COVID-19 positive employees from the workplace, and disciplinary action for employees who did not comply with the policy. Employers should also include all relevant information regarding the policy's effective date, who the policy applies to, deadlines for submitting vaccination information for getting vaccinated, and procedures for compliance and enforcement, all of which are necessary components of an effective plan. And employers are permitted to implement a partial mandatory vaccination policy that applies to only a portion of their workforce. An example might be a retail employer who has a mixture of staff working at the corporate headquarters, performing intermittent telework at home, and working in stores serving customers. In this type of situation, the employer may choose to require vaccination of only a some subset of its employees, such as those working in stores, and to treat vaccination as optional for others, such as those who work from headquarters or who telework. Okay, and some additional requirements. Employers are also required to provide each employee with information about the requirements of the ETS with the CDC document, key things to know about COVID-19 vaccines, which explains the uh, vaccine efficacy, safety, and the benefits of being vaccinated, protections against retaliation and discrimination, and laws that provide for criminal penalties for knowingly uh, supplying false statements or documentation. And with that, I'm going to hand the virtual mic over to Sherry um, to talk about uh, proof of vaccination and take us through the rest of the presentation. Thanks, Jen, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, and just uh, for your information, I know Jen said at the beginning, we have resources at the end of the presentation. So all of the things that Jen just covered, uh, sample policies and all of these additional um, notifications that you have to give employees, we have links to those at the end of the presentation. So let's talk about all the fun stuff. Uh, proof of vaccination. So covered employers are gonna need to determine the vaccination status of each employee in the company. Employers must also obtain acceptable proof of vaccination from vaccinated employees and maintain records of the employee's vaccination status, which would include whether they are fully or partially vaccinated. And when we say fully vaccinated, that means that they are two weeks beyond their second dose, if it's a Pfizer or a Moderna, uh, vaccine or uh, two weeks fall after the uh, one dose of Johnson & Johnson vaccine. So that's how they define fully vaccinated. You want to keep in mind that the proof of vaccination is considered a medical record and employers should treat that as such. So what are acceptable proofs, uh, proof of uh, vaccination? According to the ETS, that would be a record of immunization from a healthcare provider or pharmacy, a copy of the COVID-19 vaccination record card, that's that CDC card uh, that many of us got when, if you went to a mass vaccination site. Uh, you could also uh, have a copy of a medical records documenting the vaccination, a copy of a immunization records from a public health, state, or tribal immunization information system, um, or any other official documentation, but it has to include the type of vaccination administered, the dates of the administration, and the name of the healthcare professional or uh, clinic site that administered the vaccine. So for employees who are unable to produce proof of vaccination, 
if they tell you they have been vaccinated, but they can't find their card, they don't know how to get a copy, a signed and dated employee attestation is acceptable. So the attestation needs to state that their vaccine state their vaccination status and that they have lost and are otherwise unable to produce proof. In these cases, you must also require the employee to declare that the statement of their vaccination status is true and that they understand that providing false information may subject them to criminal penalties. And that's part of that notice that uh, Jen just went over that you'll be giving to employees. Another um, uh, piece of this ETS is that employers are also required to keep an up-to-date roster of each employee's vaccination status. And now this roster needs to include a list of all of your employees and in indicate for each one whether the employee has been fully vaccinated, partially vaccinated, not vaccinated because of a medical or religious accommodation, or not fully vaccinated because they haven't provided acceptable proof of vaccination. So let's say an employee says they are fully vaccinated, but they haven't given you proof yet on that roster, they would be bullet point number four. Until you have proof that they have been fully or partially vaccinated, you would consider them not fully vaccinated. All right. So another piece of the provision is uh, paid time off for vaccinations. And there's still a little, a few questions going on about this that we hope to get some clarification on from the Department of Labor. So the ETS requires employers to support employee vaccinations by allowing them up to four hours of paid time off for employees to receive each primary vaccination dose. And the reason they specify primary vaccination dose is that a lot of, uh, a lot of employees or a lot of people are eligible for that third booster shot for Pfizer or Moderna. Uh, so uh, that would not be uh, subject to this extra four hours of paid time off only those primary doses. The paid time, excuse me, for receiving a vaccination can't be offset by any other leave that the employee has accrued, such as sick or vacation time. So you can't require them to use their sick or vacation time first in, uh, to get the vaccination. However, if an employee chooses to receive a primary vaccination dose outside of work hours, let's say they go on the weekends to get their vaccine, employers are not required to grant paid time to that employee for the time spent receiving the vaccine during non-work hours. Um, employers are also required to provide what they call reasonable time and paid sick leave to employees to recover from side effects that they experience following a primary vaccination dose. But the standard does not specify the amount of paid sick time that the employee is required to provide. Employers can set a cap on the amount of paid sick leave available to the employees to recover, <clears throat> excuse me, from any side effects, but the cap has to be what they consider reasonable. So in the OSHA FAQ, and there's a link for this again at the end of the uh, presentation, it states that the employer would be in compliance if an employer makes available up to two days of paid sick leave per primary vaccination dose for side effects. Now, why is this in the FAQ and not in the standard itself? I couldn't tell you, but at least we have some guidance as to what they would consider quote unquote reasonable time. So employers can require employees to use accrued sick leave or PTO if it includes sick time for this purpose, but you, they must provide, but you must provide additional pay time off for anybody who has exhausted or doesn't have any sick or PTO available. All right, so let's move on to uh, weekly testing. So again, for those, for those of you who determine that you're going to go with, uh, if you're not gonna go with a mandatory um, vaccination policy, or even if you do go for a mandatory vaccination policy and you do have certain individuals who um, have reasonable accommodations, uh, they will still have to uh, have weekly testing. So uh, the ETS requires that weekly testing of all unvaccinated employees um, including those entitled to a reasonable accommodation from vaccination requirements. However, if testing for COVID-19 conflicts with a worker's sincerely held religious belief, practice, or observance, the worker would be entitled to a reasonable accommodation. So the weekly testing applies to employees who report to the workplace at least once every seven days, and the employees must provide documentation of the most recent COVID-19 tests no later than the seventh day following the date the employee last provided the COVID-19 test result. Bottom line is once a week, every seven days. The requirements of the standard do not apply to employees who don't report to the workplace where other individuals such as coworkers or customers are present 
uh, or while working from home. So some employees might work uh, in a maybe a remote office where there are no other employees, um, or if they are working from home 100% uh, of the time, they would not have to have, uh, they would not have to comply with these weekly uh, uh, COVID tests. However, if those same employees do come into the office periodically, let's say once a month they come in for meetings, um, they must be tested for COVID within seven days prior to returning to the workplace and provide documentation of that test result. Now, employers are gonna be required to maintain a record of each test result required to be provided, uh, that will be provided by the employee. The records must be maintained as employee medical records and must not be disclosed except as required by the ETS or other federal laws. However, these records are not subject to the same retention requirements but must be maintained and preserved while this ETS remains in effect. So for those of you who are familiar with OSHA standards, um, OSHA, anything related to uh, workplace illness or injury generally has to be kept for 30 years. Um, and honestly, to keep all of this proof of vaccination and proof of testing, um, this is gonna be a lot of documentation for some employers. So to keep that for 30 years would be pretty daunting. Um, so this will only need to be kept while the ETS is still in effect. All right, so with the weekly testing and under the ETS, a COVID test must be a test for SARS-CoV-2 that's cleared, approved, and authorized in an uh, emergency use authorization or by the U.S. Food and Drug Administ Administration, the FDA, uh, to detect current infection. Those are also known as viral tests. It has to be administered in accordance with the authorized instructions and this is the big piece of it, the test can't be both self-administered and self-read unless it's observed by the employer or an authorized telehealth proctor. So what that means is that your employees can't do a, a, an over-the-counter test at home um, and then come in and say, hey, look, it's negative. Um, you have to be, you have to see that the test is being done, um, administered and, and, and read. Uh, so for a lot of employers, it may make sense to have the employees come in 15 minutes early because most of the over-the-counter tests uh, really only take about 15 minutes. Uh, do the test there while there is somebody present for the employer to uh, proctor the test. Uh, and then once you find out that they're negative, send them off to work. So examples of tests that satisfy uh, this requirement include tests with specimens that are processed by a lab, proctored over-the-counter tests that you can pick up in, in uh, most pharmacies, point-of-care tests, those are the ones where you might go to urgent care or your doctor's office, uh, and tests where specimen collection and processing is either done or observed by the employer. Again, that means that you have your, they're doing it on your premises that you can see that they have tested negative. Um, the practice, so for those of you who have employees who are, uh, let's say employees who are on the road, um, or don't come into your workplace, but they do go into, say, client homes, customer homes, or customer workplaces, um, you may have to use technology uh, to be able to proctor these tests. Uh, COVID-19 tests uh, can broadly be divided into two categories. So there are diagnostic tests and antibody tests. So the diagnostic tests um, detect parts of the uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus, and they can be used to diagnose current infection. On the other hand, the antibody tests look for antibodies in the immune system that are produced in response to SARS-CoV-2 and are not used to diagnose an active COVID-19 infection. So those antibody tests do not meet the definition of COVID-19 tests for the purpose of this ETS. Um, the ETS also allows for pool testing and that can satisfy an employer's testing requirement. If the pooled specimen is negative, all employees who participated in the test are considered negative. If the pooled specimen is positive, additional individual testing is gonna be required to determine whether employees, which employees are positive and or negative. All right, so the big, the, uh, who pays for this uh, COVID-19 testing is the $64,000 question. Um, the ETS does not require employers to pay for the cost of the COVID-19 testing. However, an employer may be required to pay for the testing if it's required by other laws, regulations, or a collective bargaining agreement. So for example, if an employee was exempted from a COVID-19 vaccine requirement due to a disability or medical contraindication, 
if the vac to the vaccine, you would be required to pay for testing as an accommodation under the Americans with Disabilities Act. Uh, in addition, some states such as Kentucky uh, require employers to cover the cost of any employer required tests. So it really is gonna be important for those of you who, have multi, who are multi-state employers to know which states do require you to cover the cost of these tests. So now currently under the Department of Labor guidance, employers are required to pay employees for time spent waiting for and receiving medical attention, which would include COVID-19 testing at the employer's direction or on, the, on their premises during regular work hours under the Fair Labor Standards Act. So this, is, this likely includes requiring, uh, required testing occurring on the employee's uh, day, uh, on an employee's day off as well. So the Department of Labor has said that they will be updating guidance on the impact of the ETS. So this may change. So just keep an eye out for those up, that updated guidance. Uh, the Department of Labor has a really, really good FAQ on um, anything related to COVID-19. Um, so uh, just keep an eye on that. They will update that periodically. So until the Department of Labor clarifies whether an employer is required to pay for an employee's time getting tested, it's really recommended to err on the side of caution and pay employees for that time spent. All right, so what happens if you have an employee who tests positive for COVID-19? Uh, the standard requires that employees promptly notify their employer when they receive a positive test or they're diagnosed with COVID-19. And then the employer must immediately remove that employee from the workplace, regardless of their vaccination status. So even if they are fully vaccinated, if they test positive, and we're all aware that there are, have been you know, numerous breakthrough um, cases. So if they test positive, they have to be removed from the workplace. And you need to keep the employee out of the workplace until they've met the return to work criteria of the standard. Uh, the standard doesn't require the removal of an unvaccinated employee if they've been exposed to a COVID uh, positive person, nor does the ETS require notification alerts or contact tracing after the employee tests positive for COVID. So you're not required, if an employee tests positive under the ETS, you're not required to alert the, um, you're not required to alert anybody um, or to do any contact tracing, um, but you should follow any state and local public health guidance for contact tracing. So our recommendation would be that if you do have somebody test positive, contact your, your local or state um, Department of Public Health to find out what their guidance is. Uh, the employer must keep the employee removed from the, uh, from the workplace until the employee either receives a negative result on a COVID-19, what they call an NAAT test, following a, po a positive result on a COVID-19 antigen test, or the employee meets the return to work criteria in the CDC's isolation guidance, or if the employee receives a recommendation to return to work from a licensed healthcare provider. So those are the only three um, situations in which the employee can then return to work um, after testing positive. All right, another big piece of this requirement is for anybody who's unvaccinated to uh, wear a face covering in addition to that weekly testing. So under the ETS, uh, a face covering has to completely cover the nose and mouth. It has to be made of two or more layers of breathable, breathable fabric that's tightly woven. So for example, fabrics that do not uh, let light pass through when you hold them up to a light source. The face covering must be secured to the head with ties, ear loops, or elastic bands that go behind the head. If they're going to wear gaiters, uh, they should have uh, two layers of fabric or they should be folded up to make two layers. Um, they must fit snugly over the nose, mouth, and chin with no large gaps on the outside of the face. And they must be a solid piece of material without slits, exhalation valves, um, visible holes, punctures, or any other openings. All right, and uh, this is a, 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 another fun OSHA requirement, and it's gonna be, again, really uh, tricky for employers to determine, but the ETS also does require you to report each work-related COVID-19 fatality to OSHA within eight hours of learning about them and uh, work-related COVID-19 inpatient hospitalizations within 24 hours of the employer learning about the hospitalization. So how does an employer determine if a COVID-19 fatality or hospitalization is work-related? This is really, really tricky. So we look to the, to the OSHA standards regarding uh, illness or injury. 
Um, and under OSHA regulations, an employer must consider an injury or illness to be work-related if an event or exposure in the work environment either caused or contributed to the resulting condition. So if the COVID-19 exposure event likely occurred within the employee's work environment and the subsequent illness led to either death or inpatient hospitalization, reporting of the incident would be required. So an employer is not required to report a fatality or hospitalization if the employer determines that the exposure to COVID clearly did not occur in the workplace. So for example, if an employee has been on vacation when the case of COVID was contracted, this would be an indication that, it, that this was not a workplace exposure event. Um, as always, I would err on the side of caution if you, are, if you can't really determine um, whether it was contracted at work, you may want to report these incidents. All right, the cost of noncompliance. So as Jen mentioned in the beginning of the presentation, despite the current Court of Appeals stay, employers really should be taking time to get their policy set and figure out the logistics of implementing the ETS in the workplace. Are you going to go with a mandatory vaccination policy or allow the testing option? How are you going to track vaccination status? <clears throat> Excuse me, and how will you collect and store proof of vaccination and test results? Will you have employees do a proctored test at the workplace or at a local clinic? You have to be able to hit the ground running if and when this ETS goes into effect because the cost of noncompliance can be very expensive. Covered employers who ignore the ETS while it's in effect could face OSHA citations and penalties of up to $13,653 per violation and additional citations or penalties that are determined by OSHA or state OSHA for willful or egregious failures to comply. So this means a covered employer could face a penalty of that amount for each facility, area within a facility, or each employee within a facility. So what happens here is that if you are showing good faith and you're trying hard to comply with this, that, that violation may only apply to your one location. But if they determine that you have just willfully dis disregarded the ETS or any other um, egregious failure to comply, they could cite you and have, you have that $13,653 per employee. It can get very, very costly. Um, so in addition to OSHA citations and penalties, the covered employers can also face potential exposure for individual whistleblower, retaliation, negligence, and other claims potentially asserted by employees. So it's not just OSHA coming in and checking these records. It could be an employee or even a customer calling and reporting to OSHA that you're not complying with these standards. So again, this really could get very tricky for employers. So to, to not comply could be extremely expensive. All right, so uh, as promised, resource pages. So uh, we put together some resources for you in order to get the ball rolling. Uh, this first link is the main uh, page regarding the ETS on, the, on OSHA's website and has links to all the resources. It's got a lot of great information there. There are also sample policies, uh, links to the sample policies for mandatory vaccination or the one for the testing option. Um, this page, these are the notices that Jen reviewed earlier that you have to provide employees in addition to your policy. So these are the links for those. And finally, on this page, there is the uh, link for how to report uh, COVID-19 or how, what COVID-19 fatalities and inpatient hospitalizations you have to uh, provide or uh, report. Um, and then there is the emergency temporary standard FAQ. I have to tell you, without a doubt, this should be the standard every agency uses as far as their FAQs, it's an excellent FAQ. Um, do take time to review it. It's got, it just, it's very, very clear as to uh, what their expectations are. Um, and then if you really wanna uh, kind of geek out like we do and actually read the actual standard, there's a link there to the Federal Register um, for the COVID-19 vaccination and testing ETS. All right. So we've gotten a number of questions in, Jen. So why don't we hop in and start answering some of those?
I'm sorry, I was still on mute. Um, <laughs> I was saying it looks like people have been um, using both the chat and the Q and A. Yeah. So which um, I believe we we use the Q and A, correct? Yeah, yeah. But then we'll we'll, we'll go through the Q and A, and then let's we'll we'll hit the chat too and see if we can if there's anything that we haven't covered. Okay, perfect. And I just happened to see one. Um, question uh, pop up now. I'm not sure if it was in the chat, but someone was asking about the the mask requirement, if um, that was just for unvaccinated employees or if that was for all employees. So um, the requirement to wear a mask is for just for the unvaccinated employees, but employers um, shouldn't, you know, prevent vaccinated employees from wearing a mask if they would like to do so. Um, so, and it certainly it doesn't help too, right? Especially if you're a business where you're, maybe you have the public coming in, right? And they might be comfortable wearing masks. Um, certainly don't want to put any messaging out that no one um, should not, uh, shouldn't be wearing masks, but it is only required for um, unvaccinated um, employees. Yeah. And one, so, consider one consideration with that um, is that once this goes into effect and you are determining, you know, which employees are and are not fully vaccinated, um, having only unvaccinated employees wearing a mask may be a, a little bit problematic in some workplaces where you are interacting with customers, let's say in a restaurant or in a retail environment um, where, you know, you get into a restaurant and one person has a mask on and, and another person doesn't. And the customer says, Hey, I don't want, I don't want them waiting on me because obviously they're not unvaccinated. So you might consider, and there's nothing wrong with requiring your employees to wear masks. In fact, under the ETS, um, I know a lot of states have actually put bans on um, on uh, cities or employers requiring masks, but under the ETS, it actually um, overrides those bans. So if you as an employer decide, and there's a lot of major employers, I know I've seen in Target and Trader Joe's and some other places that I go to regularly, that all employees are wearing masks and that is at the direction of the employer. So it is absolutely acceptable for you to do that. And you may wanna do that if you've got a lot of customer facing employees. All right, um, so the next question, one of the other questions we got is what about remote workforces? Are they exempt from the ETS requirements? And at what point do they become part of it? So yes, they are, they do have to fall under that ETS requirement. One, you're gonna count them as part of your workforce, even if they are not in the workplace. Um, and then um, as, far as, as far as being exempt from the requirement, they're exempt from having to uh, be tested weekly or to wear face coverings while they're not in the office, but they do have to provide uh, proof of vaccination status um, and then if they are going to be coming into the workplace periodically, like we discussed earlier, um, they would have to have a negative, a negative COVID test uh, within seven days prior to coming into the workplace. Mm. All right. Um, Sherry, actually, I, I, I was curious about that. I, I, I um, don't know if I saw the, the specifics of this, but wondered if you saw when you were looking at... Um, um, proof of vaccination, um, when employers are, um, you know, uh, collecting that uh, proof of vaccination for the vaccine card, should they be capturing the information on both the front and the back of the card? You know, I didn't see anything specific to that. Um, the, the, um, the, I believe the front of the card uh, has the vaccination, all the vaccination information that you need. I know I was almost like, I want to go check my card and see, because I'm not sure what's on the back. I'm actually doing that right now. <laughs> I'm actually doing that right now. Yes, no, um, I, it would probably be just the front of the card. I'm looking at my card as we speak. And uh, it does show everything you need to know on the front of the card, um, your name, the, um, the type of vaccine you got, the date you got it and who administered it. Um, the back of the card is only uh, for your follow-up appointments. So I don't, I believe you only need the front of the card. Um, and you can, you can, as an employer to, to get proof, you can just get a copy of the card. You don't have to see the original card necessarily. Right. That's great. Yes. And for those yeah. of you who know I-9, that's different from, you know, I-9 documentation. We're so used to telling folks you need to say that, see the original card so that it is mm -hmm. nice in this case, you don't have to do that. Exactly. And you can also, so for those of you who are MP clients and use ISOLV, um, you can actually have employees just upload them to uh, the um, employee self-service site, which is really a nice, easy way to do that. Um, so any of you who want to set that up, you can reach out to your account manager, account coordinator for that. 
Absolutely. Um, I just wanted to provide some clarification. Someone had a question about, um, uh, you know, employee counts, but maybe spread out. So it looks like someone has 100 employees, but they're broken into five stores with 20 employees per store. So the it's not by individual work location, it's company wide. So if you do have 100 employees, but they are in, in broken up into um, five different stores. If, if you had 100 employees as of November 5th, then you would um, fall within the ETS. And it's not necessarily just by EIM. So for example, um, and this is, this is uh, really, uh, OSHA falls under the Department of Labor. And the way the Department of Labor looks at it is that even if you have multiple EIMs, so let's say that you have three restaurants, all three restaurants are different EINs. They might even have different ownership structures. But if they have common management and they share employees, or, or even if they don't share employees, but have common management, um, the Department of Labor would consider them one entity for the purpose of uh, most of their gui uh, most of their regulations. So I'm assuming, again, this is not a definitive yet, but I'm assuming that they would do so uh, in this case as well. So it is, it is really important to make sure that you are determining, you're counting everybody in, in, uh, in that regardless of uh, the location, it should be company-wide. All right, um, my company is a staffing firm. Can we ask potential candidates before they have an offer what their vaccination status is? And if so, where can we document their answer? So um, yes, according to the, uh, the FAQ, you can make vaccination status, a, a, a vaccine, uh, being fully vaccinated, a condition of employment. Again, always making sure that you're making those reasonable accommodations as we discussed earlier. But, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, and as far as where you can document it, that's really gonna, that's really gonna be dependent on um, what kind of systems you use. Um, it, it may be that um, you, you can document that right on an application possibly, but um, you definitely uh, can ask them if they have been vaccinated. Now, I know a lot of people think it's uh, a violation of HIPAA. HIPAA really only applies to medical providers, healthcare providers. It does not apply to private employers. Um, but what does apply is that you can't be asking people about their medical conditions. So you can ask somebody, have you uh, been vaccinated or not? That is not a medical question. But then to ask them why they have not been vaccinated, that could lead you down a very, very scary path. So um, just be very cautious about that. It's just a simple answer, yes or no. Um, you can actually ask them if they plan to get vaccinated. You could also let them know. And it may be a good idea. Again, this is if and when the ETS goes into effect. If you are going to have a mandatory vaccine policy, it might be a good idea even in your um, when you're advertising for positions to state that you do require vaccination as a condition of employment with the exception of any reasonable accommodations. Gotcha. Um, I'm seeing a couple questions just asking for some clarification about uh, PTO um, and when an employee has to use their own PTO uh, versus um, not. So um, just to clarify again, um, up to four hours of paid time off um, should be given to employees for that primary vaccination dose and then reasonable, you know, uh, time uh, to recover from side effects, two days. Um, you can't require uh, use of PTO for each uh, primary vaccination dose, but you can um, have an employee use their accrued sick time to keep, uh, PTO to recover from side effects. Um, right. And then Sherry, I, um, I don't know if you saw this one, I thought was a good question too. Um, what about if they have to be medically removed from the workplace as outlined in the uh, OSHA ETS guidance? Did you see any clarification no. there? I did, no, I did not. So yeah, um, I, I did see something in there. You're not required to pay them if they're removed from the workplace. Now, keep in mind that let's say somebody comes in for testing. I'm sorry, you're doing testing at the workplace. Um, I come in, you give me my COVID test. I test positive and you need to remove me from the workplace. I've shown up to work. So every most states have a uh, reporting time law. Um, so uh, here in Massachusetts, it's uh, two hours, two hours, two hours. Three hours. Hampshire, oh, three hours. I'm sorry. New Hampshire yes. is two hours. Thank you. Jeez. Um, no so, yep. Um, so um, if they come into work and they've reported to work uh, and you're sending them home, you just have to pay that reporting, reporting pay time. Um, the other thing is it does specify in that FAQ 
that that um, so for for the four hours of, of sick time uh, uh, to get the uh, to get your primary vaccination dose that you can't require them to use sick or PTO for recovering. Um, you can uh, re, uh, from side effects. You can, but it specifies in there. It's when it says PTO, it says PTO that includes um, sick time. So some employers call vacation time PTO and still have separate sick time. Mm-hmm. That PTO would not. You could not require employees to use. But if you're if you have PTO which includes your sick and vacation time, you can. Um, and then again, it is also going. It may also depend on state law because a lot of states that have um, mandatory um, sick time laws um, may have some conditions in those sick time laws that prevent you from requiring them to use them. So this is really gonna be a little bit tricky state to state. Um, Just, it's just gonna be, you know, always err on the side of caution when you're determining how to pay them. Mm -hmm. All right, so uh, what if they are over the road, uh, if they are an over the road truck driver, does the vaccination apply? So yes, as in, as if, as in, uh, if you are going to be, when you're, when you're uh, asking them, you do have to get their vaccination status. Um, and they do, they don't, they do have to be, um, have weekly testing. And because I'm assuming that they're going to be interacting with other people as well. Um, and then they may have somebody else in the truck. So if they have somebody else in the truck with them, um, that might change that might change the requirements. So if they do have somebody in the truck with them, they may have to both wear a mask and have weekly testing. So um, it's really going to depend on their interaction. Um, you know, once they're when they're driving, who's in the truck with them, all that. There's so many questions. I'm just trying to make sure we're getting a good okay. um, variety. We're answering yeah. a good variety okay. between I, the I chat really, and the I, Q&A. Yep. You know, I like this one. Do you have any best practices for determining slash validating sincerely held beliefs? For reasonable accommodation due to religion, and this this does get very tricky. So I have to say that it's you you don't want to necessarily uh, question whether their their religious beliefs are sincerely held. Now, if you have somebody who you know mm-hmm. says I have sincerely held religious beliefs, um, but you know doesn't really. Um, but has never called that into question before and doesn't really use that for any other reasonable accommodation, you may question, but as a best practice, it is really not a good idea to really question whether they're sincerely held. But what you can do is ask them what about their religious beliefs prevents them from either getting a vaccine or uh, being tested. Um, And then if they do have, if they can point to something that does, then you can find out what sort of accommodation that they are looking for. Um, but to question whether their beliefs are sincerely held is probably not a good idea. Okay. Um, Sherry, I, I was just um, trying to check this quickly, um, but maybe you know offhand. Um, mm-hmm. a, a commenter said the slide deck said uh, for uh, the violations, it was 13,653 per violation, but right. then thought maybe it, but discussion quoted per employee. Could we conf- confirm? Um, it, it's going to, it's going to depend on, um, how it, so any, any, if any of you have ever been through a department of labor audit, uh, what happens is, is it really depends on the auditor who's there. And if they determine that you are making a good faith effort as an employer to comply and this is just, and, and then let's say um, you haven't captured all of your testing for every single employee, they may decide, and this is really at the discretion of OSHA, they might decide you're only going to get a one violation. But if you, they come in and they see that you have just willfully not complied, um, or let's say, for example, you have allowed half of your workforce to just do a, um, an employee at a station and not require them to provide actual proof. They can look at that as an egregious failure to comply. And that's when they might determine that that, that, that penalty gets assessed to every employee. So that's gonna be conditional based on how OSHA determines, how OSHA determines it. So we can't tell you, um, you know, how you're gonna be fine. It really just depends on the situation. I've been through a numerous Department of Labor audits with clients 
And, you know, what I've seen is that, you know, when they see that you're making a good faith effort and you've just made mistakes here and there, the penalties are much less than employers who have just really disregarded any kind of regulation. So uh, it's really going to depend on your, your attempt at complying with the ETS. Perfect. And I'm also seeing a lot of questions, Sherry. Um, people are asking about the booster shot um, mm -hmm. and if this right. is kind of part of the ETS. No, the booster shot is not part of the ETS, only the primary doses. Um, and then, and again, this, this, I, I mean, I would imagine this could possibly change. So let's say, for example, the uh, federal appeals court decides to lift the stay and this goes into effect um, from all the things, you know, I've been hearing from the medical uh, community, from the uh, scientific community about the efficacy of the vaccines. If at some point they determine that a booster is going to be necessary for everybody, that could change this. But for right now, it's only the primary doses, again, the two doses of Moderna or Pfizer or um, the one dose of the uh, Johnson & Johnson. Um, the booster shot does not come into play, not required, nor do you have to provide them any time off for uh, getting the booster or for recovering from any side effects from the booster. Great. All right. Does the attestation need to be notarized to be legally binding? No, it does not. But it does need to um, does need to have a statement there that the employee understands that providing false information could result in uh, penalties. So um, I'm assuming that they'll probably uh, put out a sample form at some point. Um, but uh, right now, you just want to make sure that that attestation has all of the um, required language that is uh, in the uh, FAQ. Mm -hmm. um, and I can't remember if we said this at the beginning of the presentation, Amy probably did, but just because I'm also seeing questions, uh, folks asking if they'll still have access to this after the end of the Zoom uh, uh, presentation. Yes, everyone who registers for our webinars will get a copy of the recorded presentation and the slides. Uh, it's a good question. How could testing conflict with religious beliefs? Um, I can't point to what specific religion uh, uh, personally, but um, there may be religious beliefs that do not allow somebody to uh, have medical testing or have any kind of um, medical attention. So uh, it, it, it is possible. This is where you would ask the employee really to point to where in their religion it, it states that they cannot have testing or they cannot be vaccinated. Um, but, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I couldn't point, tell you exactly, uh, which religions would, would state that. Right. Yep. And then someone was asking if, um, I, if they could use, um, the acknowledge feature, I think they're in, um, in I solved would be sufficient for attestation if they wanted to, um, uh, use employee hmm. self-service. Um, I, I, you know what? I don't, I don't see why not. Yeah. I don't see why not because we could create um, we could create a form where the employer can create a form and then we can upload it and then um, have employee have the employee uh, electronically sign it. So I, yeah, I don't see why not. Yeah. Um, the the other thing for those of you who are MP clients, we can also set up miscellaneous fields so that you'll be able to track who's fully vaccinated, partially vaccinated, or not vaccinated for the other two reasons. Um, and then if you were uh, request, if you had to produce that information, you could just run a quick report. So again, just reach out to your account manager or account coordinator. Mm -hmm. um, here's a question about rapid tests. Are they acceptable for the weekly testing? Yes, but only those that have been approved under the um, emergent uh, that under an emergency use, auth use authorization. Sorry, that didn't come out very easily. Or have been approved by the FDA. So not all of those rapid tests that you can buy in the drugstore would um, would be acceptable. Uh, so you just have to determine which ones are approved under either of those to the e the EUA or um, or the FDA. Okay, um, someone is wondering if we've heard if there are any plans to um, mandate uh, vaccination for businesses with less than 100 employees. I haven't heard anything. Have you, Sherry? No, not yet. Not yet. They are considering it, but nothing as yet. All right. Um, eligibility question. We have less than 100 employees, but in a building with several companies, the total amount of people um, in the building is over 100. Does the landlord have to do anything for common areas, elevators, restrooms, et cetera? Um, not under this standard. 
not under this standard. They do not. Um, and that actually brings up another good question because um, one of the things that I know I've, I've been on a couple of um, legal webinars uh, regarding this. And um, one thing that comes up for those of you who are in the construction industry, um, it, it, let's say you're a general contractor and you have uh, sub, subcontractors that you hire in uh, to do, let's say, electrical work, plumbing work, et cetera. Um, you only have to be responsible for your own employees and your subcontractor would be responsible for their own employees. So if, um, if you have, let's say, 20 employees and your subcontractor has 100 employees, you would not have to, you would not fall under the, uh, the CTS, but your subcontractor may. Um, so it's not, it's really who is your employee um, and the same thing goes for, again, anybody who's using uh, employees from a staffing agency. So if you're paying a temporary employee directly, um, then they're your employee and count under this 100 um, person, 100 uh, headcount threshold. But if they are being paid um, through the staffing agency, you don't count them as part of your workforce. A lot of um, great questions here. Yeah, yeah. And, and there's a question about... Um... Uh, who who can be kind of be the person to observe another employee testing? So wondering if there's any sort of privacy violation if a non HR employee is the only person available to observe another employee testing. Now I kind of uh, towards the beginning of, of the pandemic, I uh, when we, there was more you know testing and t t t temperature checking and everything happening. A lot of times my clients would have a a, ma a designated manager doing these um, types of checks. And, you know, I, I think that's fine. I don't think it has to be. Some businesses don't have um, inter an internal HR person. So it's unlikely that you'll be able to have an HR person necessarily um, in all cases. Um, but I think you could have a manager um, do it and that would be appropriate as well. What do you think, Sherry? Yeah, I, I would agree. It, there, there, there is not uh, there, there's no uh, specific guidance on that currently. Um, I would imagine that that might be a question that might come up under the Department of Labor updated guidance. So I would just kind of keep an eye out for that. But um, in the meantime, I agree with you, Jen. I would I would uh, have uh, somebody in management doing that for now. Um, here's another good question. How do we determine if a medical exemption is valid? Do we say as long as the doctor signs off in the exemption form, will we accept that? So... Um, that's a good question. So first off, again, you don't want to ask for anybody's personal medical information, but if they're requesting a medical exemption, um, let's say they uh, need to delay uh, vaccination because of a medical situation, um, maybe somebody's undergoing some sort of treatment and their doctor advises them to hold off on getting the vaccine. Um, at the beginning, a lot of um, OBGYNs were, uh, were recommending that pregnant women hold off. That, that guidance has changed but um, you know, if your if a doctor is recommending uh, that you, for medical reasons, uh, hold off on getting the vaccine, um, you just that's the information you need. And yes, you can request you can request documentation from their medical provider um, that they are that they due to a medical condition. You don't want to know the condition. You just not need to know that due to a medical condition, they are not able to take the vaccine at this time. Um, but you don't want to get into any anything uh, deeper than that. All right, we are coming up to the uh, end of the hour here, and we've gotten a ton of questions. Um, I mean, like a ton of questions. So um, I think what we're going to do is um, probably won't be until um, Monday or Tuesday, but we'll put together an FAQ out of these questions, and we will send this out to all attendees because there's a ton. There's really a lot of really great questions in here, uh, mostly really situational, which I think is very helpful. And I do encourage you all to go to that FAQ on the uh, on OSHA's website. It it really is extremely informative. And written in very in very direct language, it's not ambiguous at all. So I do recommend that. And with that, I'm going to turn you back over to Amy to uh, take us home. Thank you so much, Sherry and Jen. Lots of fantastic information. Very timely, timely information on the webinar today. Um, please join us next week, same day and time, for a webinar outlining best practices for training and development. We'll be focusing on engaging employees in a remote and hybrid work environment, as well as valuable information on how to access the many trainings and grants that are available to employers. Just visit our website to register and see the full calendar of upcoming events and available resources. We have lots of eBooks and checklists and, and everything you need, 
And lastly, MP has a full team of HR and recruiting experts here ready to assist you with any of your HCM business needs. Thanks again for joining us today and have a terrific rest of your day.